Hi, my name's Al Hari, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm very autistic about this band called Steam Powered Giraffe. It has been very hard to write this video because they have been my special interest for months and my brain is chock full of knowledge waiting to escape from my mechanical maw. But today I'm going to be giving an, an overview of SPG's lore, which is actually pretty complicated if you go far enough. But never fear, I'm particularly obsessed with the deeper lore, the timelines, and the characters that are rarely mentioned in canon. I'm writing this under the assumption that you, dear viewer, are at least a little bit familiar with SPG and the concept of the robots being characters with backstories. This isn't an introduction video to the band as a whole. I might write that video another time, but not today, this is already going to be so long. The easiest place to start is the beginning and work our way to the present. I'll be using the official timeline and its archived versions, but I won't go over every point. As much as I love the fact that the bots were in a boy band, you can just read that on the website, there's no additional context as much as I might want some. Here I want to focus more on expanding what the timeline mentions and explaining who the characters are. I'll be skipping most of the events from the Vice Quadrant for now, but I will come back to the VQ timeline later. I don't want to overwhelm you by talking about two parallel universes at once. Let's begin in 1896. If you've watched any of their performances, you know that this is the year the robots were built. They were created by Colonel Peter A. Walter I to perform music and impress Delilah Morio, a woman of science that both he and, and his rival, Thaddeus Bisile, were in love with. This story is expanded on in the sepia tone flashback part of the main webcomic. All three of the scientists worked with the Cavalcadium, a scientific institute founded in 1874 by two badass women, Dr. Marilyn Verrado and Jacqueline Pomine. They were magic users and scientists able to sense the presence of blue and green matter. Matter in general is a magical energy source which fuels or is fueled by certain things depending on its color. Blue, which is what powers the SPG robots, runs on creativity. Green represents death and red is anger or passion. Purple and pink matter, as seen in the Vice Quadrant, are mixes of blue and red to varying degrees. Black matter is mentioned only in passing on the VQ timeline used in a death ray. As Peter One experimented with blue matter, he accidentally created Kazoo Land, an, al an alternate dimension accessed through blue matter portals that's like a hub world between other places. There's a lot of places in and around Kazoo Land that I won't be explaining here, but if you've ever seen the jokes about the John being the mayor of Biscuit Town, that's where Biscuit Town is. In order to impress Delilah Morio, Thaddeus Bisile built a bunch of giant copper elephants. Unfortunately, she fell ill and passed away. An unspecified amount of time later, Thaddeus used green matter to resurrect her. As soon as she wakes, she becomes a vampire and kills him, which, honestly, good for her. Later on, she cures her vampirism and becomes a wraith hunting vampires herself. Before his demise, though, Thaddeus instigates the Weekend War. Reports are made about copper elephants attacking rock candy mines in Africa, and Peter One is asked to stop it. He builds Delilah, a giant mechanical giraffe, and gives weapons to the musical robots so they can fight. It's implied that Zero was one of the last robots to be completed, as he has a large amount of, of weaponry and wasn't originally built for music like the others. In 1897, the Weekend War happens, three days of Walter and Bisile automatons fighting. Thaddeus and his elephants are stopped, he's kicked out of the Cavalcadium, and sometime afterwards the Delilah thing happens and he dies. After the war, Peter One repairs the robots so they can perform music. All except Zero, who gets shoved into the Walter Manor basement. Peter One has, has illegitimate twins, Peters Two and Three, with one of his maids, Iris Tonya. He marries her shortly after. Now that we're getting into the Walters, I'll start showing a family tree whenever it's relevant because there are a lot of Walters and honestly sometimes I still have to look at the timeline because there's just so many of them. Before we enter the 1900s, I'd like to mention the brown suits only because they're so wild to me. Sometime during 1987, the Cavalcadium decided blue and green matter needed to be protected from those who would abuse its power, so they created an, an organization called the brown suits. They're always seen wearing brown suits or coats and are mysterious as hell. A brown suit convinced Peter One to fight in the Weekend War, and one was present at Six's accident. We'll get to that eventually. 
The spine sometimes mentions a man in a brown suit during the pre-honeybee bit, saying he saw one in his dreams telling him to play a song about love. I had a dream last night, and a man in a long brown coat came up to me and whispered my ear, we should play a song about love. I think we should play a song about love. No clue what that means for the lore as a whole, but it's so baffling that I had to mention it. Back to the timeline. Peter One founds Walter Robotics in 1911, and in 1915, the robots perform at the first World's Fair in Balboa Park under the name the Steam Man Band. In 1917, the robots are enlisted to help with search and rescue in World War I. Peter Three fights in this war as well, becoming a colonel like his father. And, God, the bots fought in so many wars, it just gets worse. That same year, the the Cavalcadium, which had been headquartered in Balboa Park, disappears from Earth and moves to Kazooland after a failed Blue Portal incident. The 1920s is family tree time as Peter II marries Mary Mickelson, a farm girl from Virginia, in 1923. He has two children in 1924 and 26, respectively, Mark Ray Walter and Wanda Walter. They have their last child, Peter Walter IV, in 1937. In 1938, Walter Manor was hosting a gala when it was discovered Hatchworth's core was fractured, causing malfunctions and leaking blue matter. Peter II locked Hatchworth in a vault intended to be temporary until a solution was found, but he isn't actually released from the vault until 2013, over 70 years later. In 1941, Rabbit, the Spine, the John, and Upgrade serve in World War II. Upgrade was a nurse and the others assisted on the front lines. They return home in 1945. Unfortunately, while they were away, in 1942, Peter One died in his sleep at the age of 78. It's unknown when Iris died, but I've always assumed that it was some time before this. Peter Five is born to Mark Ray and his wife Judith in 1947. Judith dies during childbirth. Later that year, Wanda marries Professor Guy Hotty, a person we know nothing about besides the fact that their name is Guy Hotty. Okay, 1950. Are you ready? This is the big one. Ignatius M. Besile and Dr. Norman Besile, assumed to be sons of Thaddeus Besile, kidnap Rabbit for her blue matter core and mess with it. Peter II, Peter III, and Guy Hadi break into the Besile lab to stop this and are caught in a giant explosion that rips through space time, creating a portal above Earth as well as the parallel universe Omega. We'll return to Omega later. As a result of the explosion, Peter II and Guy Hadi are vaporized. Peter III suffers a stroke, and Ignatius's right arm is paralyzed. Norman is transformed into his current body and experiences a traumatic brain injury that gives him an unspecified cognitive disability. At some point between this incident and 1956, Norman moves into Walter Manor. A year later, in 1951, Mark Ray dies in a freak car accident that is sort of implied, sort of headcanoned, to be caused by the B-Siles. Peter V, his son, is taken to an orphanage at four years old. In 1955, a desperate Peter III makes a financial deal with Ignatius, and Peter IV joins the Marine Corps. It's unknown if those two things are related, or even what the terms of the deal were. 1956 brings the New Pennsylvania World's Fair, commonly stated as being the fair that Clockwork Vaudeville was written about. The Spine was a featured robot, having new human-like upgrades to his face. His makeup from when the band first started is this human upgrade, and he reverted back to his more mechanical look in 2013 when Hatchworth joined. Ignatius is arrested for conspiring against Peter III, with Norman testifying against him. Three dies shortly after, presumably from complications related to the 1950 incident. Peter V, only nine years old, inherits the manor and moves in with Wanda and Norman. 1962. Vice Quadrant stuff really kicks off here. I won't go too into detail yet, but this is when Peter IV becomes Commander Cosmo. Hey, guess what? Another war happens. It's 1965, and Rabbit, the Spine, and the John serve in the Vietnam War. They go missing mid-combat, and that's... terrible. My gods. At least Upgrade doesn't serve because she's a hippie now, canonically dodging the draft. Good for her. However, she's dragged back to the manor in 1969 by Peter Five after trying to start a solo singing career. The robot's broken chassis are returned to the manor in 1973, eight years later. 
I really can't deal with this sometimes. They were missing and broken for eight years. Anyway, they're all repaired in 1974 and start touring again. Peter 5 develops QWERTY in 1983 to be the robot's operating system. It's never mentioned when Bebop was created. I've always assumed that he was made alongside the robots in 1896, but that's up to you. 5 marries Annie Burnett and has Peter 6 in 1986. The John is remodeled to run off Crystal Pepsi in 1992 for a marketing campaign that fails horribly. Here's a picture from the old website, it's very funny. Bebop finds Zero in the basement and they become best buds, but Zero doesn't leave the basement yet. In 1996, Upgrade starts refusing any software updates. From 1992 to 2006, the robots repeatedly attempt to update to the newest version of Windows and it fails every time. Finally, 5 destroys the Windows disks and installs QWERTY permanently. As a Linux user, I think that's very valid of him. We've made it to 2008. The bots start performing in Balboa Park under the name Steam Powered Giraffe. 5 finds Zero singing in the basement and reconstructs him for music so he can join the band. Upgrade leaves the band in 2011 to become a princess. In 2012, John leaves to explore Kazooland and take care of mayoral duties in Biscuit Town. Zero also leaves to try out a solo career. Walter Robotics loses the rights to his voice, so he has to be edited out of everything. In 2013, Peter Six ends up in an implosion of blue matter energy while repairing a rift in space-time. He starts wearing his signature keyhole mask. While building his mask, he discovers a way to repair Hatchworth, who joins the band. Gigi the giraffe, the brattiest little sister anyone could ask for, is discovered in the basement. Wink the satellite crash lands near the manor in 2014, and by the next year, Six has converted him into a spaceship. The bots have adventures in space, we're almost to the vice quadrant, I swear, and return home. Zero attempts to invest in the abstract concept of love and writes a biography about it. It only sells one copy, my poor boy. In 2017, Hatchworth leaves the band to try gold fishing, whatever that means, and Zero officially returns from his solo career. And that's it. We're at the present. Six is the CEO of Walter Robotics, living in the manor with five, Annie, Wanda, Norman, and the robots. Some loose threads. Buster Beesile is born at some point, presumably Ignatius' son, because Norman is at the manor. Speaking of Norman, at some point between 1950 and 2017, he marries Wanda. This is implied because in 2017, she's referred to as Wanda Beesile. Even though I firmly believe Norman would take the Walter name instead, I love that for them. It's implied they raised five together. They're in love. Read my fanfic. Okay. I hope that wasn't too mind-numbing because it's time to talk about the Vice Quadrant. Everything that I've just gone over happened in SPG's equivalent of our world, known as Universe Prime. The 1950 incident created the parallel universe Omega, where certain things are different. You can see everything important side by side on the official timeline, but I'll explain it here too. When Rabbit's core exploded, it created a portal in the sky above Earth. In 1962, Peter IV is the commander of the spaceship known as the Cosmo, which explodes when a blue matter beam hits it. Four is also hit with the energy, which gives him superpowers and he becomes the hero Commander Cosmo. In Omega, the ship is missed by the beam, and Four researches the portal to advance humanity's progress and create a technological revolution. Instead, the beam hits a, Ru a Russian space probe carrying human DNA creating the Daughter of Space, also called Cosmica. Omega-4 is aboard a space militia ship in 1964 when it catches on fire. He survives, but witnesses his crew members die. This is what Fire Fire is about. Two years later, in 1966, Cosmica accidentally destroys his squad ships while he's on a patrol mission. He's saved by Cosmica, and she brings him deeper into space, becoming the astronaut. Meanwhile, in Prime, Commander Cosmo has been a superhero for the whole of Earth, fighting off various threats. Space pterodactyls, Martian tripods, spider demons, sky sharks, alien ghosts, Dr. Blight, the star blood beast. He saves the day over and over. In 1988, he enters a portal called the Achilles Rift, which brings him into Universe Omega. Extremely depressed, he seals himself on a star and hopes it will kill him, which gives life to the Necro Star. He starts fighting to destroy it, both of them trapped inside the star. 
After Cosmo leaves th through the rift, Jumbo the Space Whale closes it and destroys 10 solar systems in the process. A few years later, in 1992, a little Peter Six senses a cosmic disturbance and starts the Wink Project, Wandering Intelligent Navigational Nights. They're sent off into space. One of them finds the Green Apple Planet being eaten by a space giant and returns home to ask his creator for help. In 2014, the Sky Sharks attack Earth once again, but this time Commander Cosmo isn't there to save the day. The robots set everything on fire instead. Wink crash lands and, be and begs the robots for help, so Six starts turning him into a full spaceship. Wink's upgrades are completed in 2015 and the bots head off into space. They confront the space giant, who turns out to be an SPG fan from Universe Omega. It leaves the Green Apple alone after hearing a few songs. Wink chooses to stay with the Green Apple planet, so the bots head home, spotting space whales on the way. Unbeknownst to the bots, the whales are fleeing the Vice Quadrant because of the Necrostar. The bots get home, but that's far from the end. The majority of VQ's juicy story happens in Universe Omega, where last we left off in 1988, Commander Cosmo was fighting the Necrostar. Jumbo mentioned before as closing the, the Achilles Rift is a Time Guardian and also a giant talking whale. He finds Cosmo and the Necro Star fighting inside the star and jails them both in an interdimensional prison. As this occurs, the Necro Star is reaching across time and space to influence things, creating many of the monsters Cosmo fought back on Earth and even getting the space giant into SPG. It's 1994 back on Earth and all nations have united for world peace and reaching out into the stars. Many settlements are made all over the solar system from the moon to Jupiter. The VQ timeline jumps over a century to 2185. Ravax's Starburner, alien descendant of Rex Marksley and captain of the SS Alexander, blows up the Necrostar and frees Cosmo from prison. This also frees a fragment of the Necrostar. Oops. Meanwhile, the astronaut and Cosmica are destroying a moon base, as seen in the song Oh No. Commander Cosmo teleports Cosmica away, which kills the astronaut. Unfortunately for literally everyone in the universe, the Necrostar fragment that escaped prison finds the astronaut's corpse and lashes on, turning him into the Necronaut. He starts preparing to conquer Earth, foreshadowings of which we can hear at the end of Quintessential and 1896. And, well, that's it. We'll have to wait for the seventh or maybe the comic to see what happens next with the characters of the Vice Squadron. Hopefully this info dump was informative or at least entertaining. If you have any questions or corrections, please leave them in the comments. Subscribe and do all that YouTube stuff if you want. You can tip me on Ko-fi if you like my work or want to commission me to draw silly robots. Uh, you should support the band on Patreon too. See you later. Hey. Uh, what? Hey. Owls. Hey. Oh. Hi. Could I perhaps talk about the robots now? No, I told you, you can do that next week. Uh, anyway, bye everybody.